Howdy folks, thanks for checking in to Mr. Ulrich's Land of Biology.com. I am Mr. Ulrich. In this podcast, we're going to be taking a look at different types of tools that are used in biological research. If there's one tool that has most impacted the study of living things, it would have to be the microscope. We're going to be looking at several different types of microscopes. One category of microscope that we'll be looking at are the light microscopes. All of the light microscopes work on the same type of premise by using rays of light either going shining through a really thin specimen or bouncing off the surface of a specimen. Even the lowly uh, magnifying glass counts as a light microscope. This is a laboratory compound light microscope. It's a little more highfalutin than the type that we'll be using in class, but it has all the same parts as a typical uh, compound light microscope. We'll spend some more time in the lab looking at this and uh, going over each of the individual parts when we have one sitting in front of us. Another type of compound light microscope is the dissecting microscope or the stereo microscope. It is a light microscope. Uh, it does shine light, but uh, this one, instead of shining through a really thin specimen, it actually bounces the light off of the surface of the specimen. Since we're only looking at the surface, we can look at opaque specimens, really thick sections. Um, and not have to worry about light transmittance. The two oculae allow for the 3D binocular image to be seen so you can see depth and uh, there's no image flip so that makes these perfect for in-class dissections. Another type of light microscope is the phase contrast microscope. This is an interesting type of microscope and instead of using regular light it uses polarized light and this allows it to get uh, a lot better contrast. Uh, because of the polarized light and uh, the way the light interacts with the specimen, uh, no stains are necessary and this allows us to use um, uh, the, phase excuse me, the phase contrast microscope on clear specimens. The stains typically are not so friendly, so not having to use them allows us also to look at living specimens and get some pretty cool shots of uh, cells going through life, doing uh, living processes like mitosis. Another category of microscopes, different from light microscopes, are electron microscopes. Instead of using beams of light, electron microscopes use um, beams of electrons. Uh, because of the physics of electrons and the physics of light, uh, the difference between that, uh, the beam of electrons allows us to get really high magnification and really, 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 really good resolution. There are two types of electron microscopes that we should be familiar with. There are more than two types, uh, but the two main types that we should be familiar with are the transmission microscope. These are called the TEMs, which just stands for a transmission electron microscope, uh, where the electron beam actually passes through the specimen. So the specimen has to be sliced really, 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 really thinly. The other type of microscope, electron microscope, is the scanning, or SEM electron microscope and here the electron beams bounce off of the specimen so this gives us really really good uh, surface pictures with uh, excellent resolution. So this is a picture of a transmission electron microscope. You might notice that there aren't any eyepieces. Uh, it's because it's not using optical light. Uh, the beam of electrons can be transmitted directly to a video display and uh, we would get the picture that way. This is a shot of a scanning electron microscope. Once again, uh, no eyepieces necessary. Pictures from a scanning electron microscope are called uh, micrographs and they give us some uh, neat up-close pictures 
and high resolution shots of some things that we might even be able to see with our naked eye but certainly not with the amount of detail that we can see here this is a uh, fly eye from a regular old house fly you can see the individual hairs in between the individual omatidia of each eye pretty cool these are the mouth parts of a tick this is the head of a male mosquito. You can tell it's a male because the mouth parts are all furry. Here's a couple for you to guess on. What do you think these are? Hit pause after it comes in. So yeah, what do you think that is? Hit pause. That is a fly's foot. What do you think this one is? Hit pause. That is a mascara brush. How about this one here? Hit pause, I'll wait. That is Velcro. And last... That's toilet paper. Hopefully not used. Here's an old philosophical question. How does a person eat an elephant? Of course, the answer is easy, one bite at a time. Some issues in science can seem as insurmountable as eating an elephant. And the way that we often attach, or excuse me, attack big uh, problems is uh, to look at them in a reductionist or empirical way. And this means to break up complex problems into small problems, and then you try to uh, investigate and understand all the little parts, so that once you understand how the little parts work, you can put it all together and you can understand the sum. So techniques that allow us to separate, to tweeze, uh, complex mixtures and complex compounds into their individual parts for analysis is going to be a uh, very helpful and useful technology. There are three different uh, separation techniques that we're going to be looking at. The centrifuge, chromatography, and electrophoresis. The centrifuge works on the same premise as the spin cycle on a washing machine. Uh, by putting mixtures into small test tubes as is being held in the picture on the left um, and then allowing those test tubes to spin around very fast uh, if they spin around really really fast it's called an ultra centrifuge Woo! Uh, but spinning the particles uh, separates the mixtures putting the more dense um, parts particles closer to the bottom and the lighter ones uh, will float up on the top this is used in laboratories to separate blood into its constituent parts uh, very, very uh, commonly. Chromatography is actually a whole classification or a whole group of different techniques of analysis by, that all end up separating chemicals based on their molecular size. We're going to be looking at paper chromatography, which uh, does this by taking a solution and passing it through uh, in, you know, paper. We use uh, filter paper and uh, different molecules move through the filter paper with a solvent at different speeds and that allows us to separate them by size. The classic example is using ink. A dark ink is often a mixture of different pigments and so you take a strip of paper as is uh, pictured on the left. Uh, you put a little ink spot on it, you dip it in a little bit of water. Uh, the water, as the water wicks through and up the paper strip, it uh, liberates and moves uh, the molecules, the different pigments of the ink as it moves through the paper. And uh, as you move through the intermediate there in the middle of the page, you can see the water level has moved halfway up the strip and it started to separate the individual pigments. And at the finish on the right side of the paper, uh, the right side of the diagram, you see the water level has moved all the almost all the way up to the top and has fully separated the three different pigments in that one ink spot. Uh, using 
inks in paper chromatography are classic uh, demonstration tools. So here's a picture of different magic markers, I believe, that were moved through paper using paper chromatography. The last separation technique is uh, pretty involved. It's called electrophoresis. Um, now, electrophoresis is most often used to separate a mixture of different sized pieces of DNA by putting the mixture of DNA fragments uh, in a special gel uh, and then adding electricity. It moves through much the same way as electro, uh, excuse me, as paper chromatography, uh, except instead of using uh, instead of using a solvent moving through paper now we're using electricity to force the molecules to move through a medium so if we're going to separate a mixture of different sized fragments of DNA we need to get a bunch of different sized fragments of DNA typically the way this is done analytically is we take some DNA from one organism and expose it to a type of compound called a restriction enzyme. Restriction enzymes are really neat. What they do is they will cut DNA at a particular base sequence. This is uh, echo R1 in this diagram. It's probably the most famous and most, uh, most used restriction enzyme and it cuts at GAATTC. So we take that sample of DNA which is now cut up into a whole bunch of fragments and we put that in one of these sample wells and if we're comparing the DNA of different organisms uh, or different individuals each well would have one individual's DNA cut by the same uh, restriction enzyme then an electrical field is, is applied and the uh, different size fragments will then move through the medium of the gel at different rates. So you can actually tell how big the uh, fragments are relative to one another by how far they move through that medium, through the gel. This way, side by side, when you put different individuals side by side, you can tell how big the different fragments are in each individual. The idea being, if the individuals are more closely related, then the DNA code is going to be more close. And those restriction sites, the GAATTCs, that the ECHO R1 cuts at will be at the same spots, and therefore the fragments will be the same size, and you'll have more same-sized fragments. And so individuals that are more closely related would have the same little stripes, the DNA fragment stripes, at the same, um, at the same levels. And then we could tell uh, degrees of relatedness. Another group of technologies that are employed by uh, biologists and, well, all kinds of people are uh, indicators. These are compounds that show different chemical properties, uh, most often by a color change. Uh, lots of people can use these. That's why they're referred to as low tech. You don't need a whole lot of training. Um, many people have uh, swimming pools and these are used there so uh, these are really really common and very helpful analytically uh, not just for pH even uh, urinalysis dipsticks uh, a lot of uh, information and a lot of data can be pulled and uh, compiled using uh, different indicators tissue culturing is another rapidly developing uh, area of research and development. It is growing tissue outside of the body. Uh, kind of like uh, we've uh, started more and more uh, able to grow skin that can be used to uh, help burn victims. The idea of course is to move from individual tissues to growing organs that can be used for transplant. Not quite there yet but we're getting awfully close this also provides an uh, opportunity for ethical uh, alternatives to animal testing. Right now, quite a bit of uh, testing is done on um, vertebrates, on rabbits and dogs and cats and monkeys and rabbits and uh, rats and all kinds of organisms. Um, oftentimes subjecting them to harm, pain, and death even. 
Um, and tissue culturing can provide an alternative to that by we can test these compounds on uh, tissues, see if there's damage to the tissues uh, rather than uh, damaging whole organisms.